now chairing the um, the uh, panel session um, for presentations. My name is uh, Jeremy Hines um, from Savills. Um, my role um, at Savills is um, a national director for um, retail and um, planning. Um, and so um, I'm very honoured to be able to uh, introduce to you um, three people who are all very expert in different ways on um, high streets, um, town centres, um, urbanism and regeneration. Um, in the um, immediate aftermath or the continuing continuum of uh, COVID-19, I'm not sure where we stand in the spectrum of that, but um, there might be some interesting ideas as to uh, how uh, people might want to rethink our town centres. So we have, um, um, uh, and in order of the presentations, there will be um, David Rudlin, who is the former uh, uh, chair of the Academy of Urbanism and currently director of Urbed. John Hoyle, who is CEO of Souk, um, um, which um, specialises in adapted retail space. And I'll leave that there for John to elaborate further. And Rachel Campbell, head of regeneration at MHCLG. Um, but there are other acronym, acronyms which I'm sure she will introduce you to. Uh, so um, on that, I'll introduce you to um, uh, David. Uh, so my control mute, I can't find my cursor, which always happens. Um, thank you, thank you, Jeremy. Um, I, I wanted to start by by saying one of my earliest memories was um, going shopping with my mum um, back in the sixties. I'm really quite old, um, and our local corner shop, which was called Williams Corner, um, had gone um, self service, which completely shocked my mum. Um, she was given a basket and told to take the stuff off the shelves herself, rather than um, being um, served by Mister Williams. Um, and it was the start of a revolution which really marked the first crisis in the high street. The high street that we all love and, and still myth, myth, mythologize doesn't exist anymore. It was 90% um, of re grocery spending goes through the supermarkets. Um, the second um, crisis happened in the 90s when the government allowed a whole tranche of out-of-town um, retailing and um, did untold damage to existing town centres. And that's when the first high street policy was brought in, vital and viable town centres and PPG6 and so on. Um, the third crisis was a bit different. You know, the third crisis was when in the 2000s, big retailing really took off and, and became very valuable. And the clone town um, concern was that all the high streets were starting to look the same and independent retail was being squeezed out. Um, the fourth crisis happened in the financial crisis um, and resulted in us a few years later getting Mary Porters telling us how to revive our high streets. And interestingly, since that time, the high streets recovered quite well. Big retailing didn't, and big retailing has suffered all the way through. But retail spend in the um, in the in the uh, I don't know what you call the, the the decade just gone, but did reasonably well up until um, 2018, 2019, um, when we started to get this accumulative um, bad news about um, certainly large retailers having to cut back and so on. Um, and then we hit COVID, and that's probably the last crisis in the high street, and none of us quite know what what that's going to be yet. So. Um, we're doing research for the 1851 Commission at the moment at Urbed. We have um, money for two years to look at the crisis in the high street. And as a result, I've read, um, or my colleagues have read, every report that's been written in the last 20 years on high streets. Um, there's a lot of them, and they all say very similar things. They all have a very clear picture about what they want the high street to be, which is to move away from retailing to something which is more mixed use, which is more community-based, which is more leisure-based, and so on. And most of them have a very poor idea about how to get from where we are now to where we, we need to be. There, there, there's very little um, agreement on that. Some actually suggest that we should be CPOing High Street, which is obviously a bonkers idea, um, to, to, to take control in the same way as a um, shopping centre has control of the, the, the High Street. There's lots of discussion about things like environmental works, um, like um, town centre management and bids and so on. All these things do no harm at all, um, but actually they aren't the silver bullet that I think this session is after. Um, and my my suggestion really about how um, we need to address high streets is to um, to look back at those previous five crises and actually look at the extent to which high streets have recovered. They are incredibly resilient things. They will recover if you allow them to do so. And what we should be focusing on in policy terms is um, policy measures to allow them to do that. Now, um, there are certain people at the moment think that that means permitted development rights. 
Um, and I would say to you solely in that respect, if, if allowing the well-loved butcher at the middle of your high street to be converted to flats um, is the strategy to revive the high street, I suggest you're, you're, you're misguided. P PD rights is all well and good, but planning is not the problem on most high streets. The problem is financial. The problem is the ability of um, companies to make an investment in properties, which I suspect John will be talking about um, soon, sort of um, a low cost, low commitment uh, ability to try something out um, to look at taking a unit on and do something different. And that's what we need to do. And the, what, the sort of bullet that I would suggest, the thing that we really need to do to make that happen is to look at business rates. Um, business rates, it seems to me, has been, has done the, the most damage than anything else to high streets. Not only the initial revaluation, but then the suggested revaluation and then the phased way in which that was brought in, um, has, has added hugely to the cost base of many retailers, exacerbating an already difficult situation on many high streets. And if the government wishes to um, revive our high streets, I suggest that um, a business rates hold day, but going further than that, actually a, a tax system where um, online retailers and physical retailers are taxed in a level playing field way um, so that physical retailers can, can, can get a, 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 a more fair a, a attempt at a, a trading. So that's my silver bullet to, um, to resolve the tax system for retailing so that physical retailers and, um, and online retailers are, are dealt with equally. Thank you. Um, um, thank you very much, David. Um, interesting, um, David, in your, in your commentary, you had identified, well, I got down as five um, so-called crises. Um, you didn't list in that, um, in that though, um, the internet. Uh, and um, you alluded to it, I think. Um, I thought you were gonna say something about that when you came onto the financial crisis. But you didn't directly, and I just wonder whether John might um, pick up on that and see whether or not the um, the um, internet is um, um, a cause for the decline of the high street. Um, I, I notice how you picked up on out of town retailing and the, the rise of um, big shed retailing. Um, I'd be interested to hear, um, Rachel, whether you have any comments on whether you think um, it was um, big box retailing that led to the cloning of the high street and um, an identikit town. And, and whether identikit towns indeed might be um, um, a, a problem of their own type, um, which I think has been contributed to by um, planning policy. Um, um, John, do you want to um, take up on the lead on that and um, and talk about um, digital, digitally enhanced high streets and adaptive retail space, and see and be interested to see whether that responds to the uh, the silver bullet bullet rather of um, equalising um, the tax base between online and physical retailing. I'm, I'm happy to respond to it. Do you want me to do that as part of my pitch or as uh, a separate question? Um, I, th I think, well, either, whichever is more easiest for you to, uh, to address. Um, well, uh, why don't I give you my pitch, which ha does it have an element of embracing um, the digital element um, uh, and, and, and cover it as a question at the end? Yeah. Okay. Great. OK, um, well, Thank you for that. Some um, really interesting from David and some common ground of what, what I'm talking about. Um, so I'm John. I'm the founder of uh, Souk. We rent shops by the hour uh, with the goal of maximising the utility of the spaces across a full spectrum of the week in order to increase affordable access for everyone from brands like Amazon to community groups and individuals. And I start with this context because when we launched, we made a really conscious effort to create a sustainable and profitable business plan that could perform within the existing rules of the game. I have the luxury of not having to think about the whole landscape of the high street, which is obviously enormously complex. As a result, we focused relentlessly on what I think is the biggest problem of the high street, and that's the broken relationship between landlords and occupiers. And when you think about it, this is at the centre of so many of our major issues. Um, we might talk about cloned high streets where basically only the most financially powerful brands can survive. And out of control occupation costs driven by the industry, which are linked directly to the rates that David mentioned. And all of this leads to empty shops because there are such high barriers to entry and op occupation. And we're all complicit in creating this situation where there's now a complete disconnect existing between the commercial environment surrounding the high street and the people who actually use it. And I think the, the wonderful thing about a terrible pandemic is that it's exposed the absurdities in the way that we all interact with our high streets. And I'm going to focus on four key points around that area. So the first one is 
in too many instances, the wrong people actually own shops. Our high streets can't just be a passive investment. Um, and in too many cases, they still are. If you don't have a vested interest in seeing the occupiers of the assets that you own as a landlord, then the decline of our town centres is assured. The future needs to be about flexible partnerships where everyone can make a living. Um, but the implementation of this is, is much easier said than done, which leads me on to my second point, which is that the world has changed forever, but that change will not be overnight. Um, I mean, we've seen a complete obliteration of entrenched landlord attitudes, but making the transition to a more um, sustainable model is going to be slow and it's going to be painful. A whole industry has evolved to kind of uh, protect itself from the kind of property revaluation that's now required. And although Corona has obliterated those attitudes, still lots of people um, have are, are refusing to recognise that change is needed. Now, I don't want you to think that I'm laying all the blame at landlords' doors. I used to be one. In fact, many landlords have been pioneering a way forward well in advance of Corona. The problem is the sort of system that we've all accepted and let, let evolve. And retail itself has a, a question to answer because my preference is that the way retail has traditionally operated is absurd. When you think about it, um, the way most of our biggest brands use shops is, is a bit ridiculous. Retailers trade a large capital contribution from a landlord in return for an inflated long term rental commitment. They then spend all that cash on creating what is to all intents and purposes a warehouse. They fill these shops with millions of pounds worth of stock, putting pressure on their own cash flows. And then they have to staff and operate those shops across seven days of the week, even though most of these shops are only profitable for a tiny percentage of that time. Um, we believe that the, the, the sort of future is actually with more online brands than ever before. Shops need to become a crucial place to showcase and engage with customers, but should not be an important part of lo the logistical chain that they're currently embedded in. And I think that part of um, the answer to the digital piece, I believe that we should em embrace um, online retail and use our high streets in a different way. My fourth point, um, and this is again something David um, mentioned, is that now, our town centres are not and should not be predominantly about retail. I'm really pleased about an element of the change of um, planning approach, allowing flexibility outside of A1 retail, because we found that low value retail hours are actually super valuable to all sorts of other occupiers. And at Souk, our morning and evening slots are as valuable to us in terms of income as kind of the nine to five standard retail slot, which is really interesting. Um, and these occupiers are overwhelmingly not retailers and the uses they have don't rely on footfall, they actually drive it. So if for the majority of the week people don't want or need retail, then why are we at such pains to cater for it? Isn't there more value to be gained from driving accessibility to spaces for a whole host of other users? And just to finalise, I hope we can use this corona opportunity in time to embed a sustainable financial model in our high streets. And at suit, we really hope to be at the forefront of this. John, thank you for that. Um, um, I think I, I, I think that's a bit of a challenge, um, to say the least. Um, I mean, if I if I understand your point correctly, then one of the um, outputs would be that what we might term a retail space um, might actually be flexibly used for all sorts of uses. Um, um, and not therefore exclusively as a as a retail offer that has become understood in the sense of buying, selling, and distributing, and displaying goods. Um, and, and that that's that's not just a challenge, I think, in terms of the concept. Um, and uh, David, it'll be intriguing to see how, in a sense of um, how urban places operate, how you could have um, such places being so flexibly used. Um, but also it presents a significant challenge to the owners of that property as to how they would both manage it and also how they might see it as a source of income. Um, um, Rachel, that's, um, that there's an overlap, it seems to me, between one of the observations uh, um, in, um, by David and, and John in, in the sense that um, retail became a significant asset class. Um, and um, and therefore a a significant part of the uh, insurance and um, pension history for the UK fund, um, and um, that 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 was um, not um, 
that was not prevented by the government or the institutions themselves. Indeed, they, they went they went headlong into it, and it became one of the most profitable uh, asset classes in its own right, including in in large retail centres out of town. I mean, there were there were reports of retail warehousing at Foss Park in Leicester, for example, um, hitting seventy pounds per square foot. When, as a original concept, retail warehousing was meant to offer vast amounts of very cheap floor space, but that that became um, 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 lost in the um, in the quest by the institutions for more and more investment returns. Um, so, with with that, I wonder, in, in terms of what you're about to say, and of course, I don't know what you're about to say yet, um, <laughs> um, whether um, the concept of regeneration also has to deal with both. Some of the ownership points that have been alluded to in um, in, in John's piece um, and the challenge that presents, um, as well as picking up how do you create mixed uses throughout town centres as well and encourage people, as both I think John and, and David have been saying, that um, town centres should not be the exclusive preserve of a shopping environment or retail. Okay, well let's see how much I pick some of that up and what I was going to say, and if not, you can come back to me at the end. Um, so I don't know, Jeremy, if you, if you said this at the beginning, but apparently people are going to be asked what they think of the different pitches at the end. I'm probably going to immediately shoot myself in the foot by saying that I don't think it is for government to stand here and pitch what every town centre should look like and should indeed do. So I think what I'm going to do is slightly different and talk a bit about why we care about high streets and town centres, given it's the start of the day, hopefully people are a week enough to deal with that and then talk a bit about what's happened in the last six months and how governments responded but then how I think we should all look forward. Um, the challenges of the high street and town centre they're not new they're not caused by Covid they're, they have been changes over the last five years really in terms of changing consumer behaviour particularly around retail but also just in terms of wanting more experience more community services and, and more just professional services on the high street. Places have benefited in different ways from economic growth that's been seen in the UK. But fundamentally, people still want to use their high street and their town centre as a centre for job creation, but also as a centre for communities. The big challenge over the last six months for government, for local authorities and for owners and occupiers on high street has been how do we go against everything that we've tried to do in terms of driving footfall, making people use space more differently, making people benefit from their town centre and fundamentally stop people from gathering in these places, particularly at the start of the pandemic. So government intervention went from how do you drive footfall to the success of some of these closure measures will be measured by declines in footfall which is obviously hugely challenging, not just for um, government making that balance, but also for, for those who are then trying to keep their businesses going on the high street. Footfall dropped dramatically, but is obviously now increasing. Internet sales shot through the roof, going up to an all-time high of about 33% back in May. And about one in four businesses didn't have any income during the height of the lockdown, which then in turn has a huge impact on the ownership sector, with commercial rents collection only reaching about 63% 35 days after the June quarter. What we're all dealing with now is how do you safely reopen and stay open um, and adapt business models to comply with new social distancing measures, which I agree, Jeremy, I don't think anyone knows where we are on the, on the continuum, but I think we would be naive to think that these will be in place for a very short time. So government has obviously um, done a lot to help support businesses over the last six months. You all know the headlines of business rates cuts, VAT cuts, support for the hospitality sector, the retail hospitality leisure grants, the local authority discretionary grants, and indeed changing to planning policy, which have come up. Um, alongside that, we've also introduced measures to support commercial businesses um, from being evicted if they were unable to pay their rent. Um, we've accelerated the work of the High Streets Task Force, which would be good to cover uh, in a bit more detail, which has been set up um, to support local leaders in terms of setting their vision for places um, and providing direct training to support them in planning, design and fundamentally in understanding and making best use of data. 
Um, we've also launched a £50 million reopening high street safely fund and we've legislated to allow business improvement districts, which were due to ballot this year, to continue into next year and provided up to £6 million worth of funding to support business improvement districts. But that's all in the last six months. And as I said, this um, pandemic in this context is going to last for quite a long time. I think that David was talking about the many, um, the many, many reports that have been published over the last 20 years. And there's something in that that I think we, should, we shouldn't think that we need to start from scratch here. The context is different. The acceleration certainly is different. We've probably seen in the last six months what we would have expected to see in the next six years. But I feel as though people have an understanding of what we want to see from high streets and town centres and um, not necessarily a direct route map, but a good understanding of, the, I think, the principles of what we need to get there. And it's those four principles that I'll maybe say that I think that government has a bit more of a role in. Because even though we have a role, fundamentally, change is only going to be possible if thriving high streets are underpinned by strong local leadership, community involvement, and then given support where appropriate from central government. So there's four things really that underpin that. The first one is investment, and government is helped supporting that through the £3.6 billion Towns Fund, which includes the £1 billion Future High Streets Fund, which is both of which are delivering um, up to £25 million of investment to separately groups of um, 100 towns. The second point is information and access to information to understanding what local leaders and community groups can do, what levers they have or could have to be able to drive forward change in their places is just absolutely fundamental, um, particularly around that point around understanding the digital aspect and the reams of data that places have at their fingertips but perhaps don't yet know how to make best use of. And that's partly what our High Streets Task Force is helping to do, particularly in the immediate recovery. The third point is about inspiration. So I completely agree with the concerns about having identical towns where places don't play to their strengths. But there is something about places learning from each other, not necessarily in trying to create the exact same space, but in understanding how they were successful and what made that happen in those areas. And then the fourth point is around innovation. So government has created some new approaches to bringing empty properties back into use through things like our um, open doors project or supporting business improvement districts. But things like SUC has outlined are really innovative approaches to how do you in particular make best use of empty vacant properties or places at risk of doing that? How do you how do you create and highlight new innovative approaches? To answer the question of whether or not it's an end or a new beginning, I think I would just go back to saying, to echoing what we said before, that town centres have been a crucial part of the economy and of communities in Britain for thousands of years. And they have gone through crises before, they will go through crises again, but they have always adapted and continue to adapt because people do and what people want from them changes. So the fundamental thing that it would be good to get from this conversation is how do we all, whether you are a landlord, an occupier, an academic, local authority, government, how do you help create a framework and space where people are able to be innovative, to be flexible um, and to drive forward that change so that high streets can transition from a retail base to a more diverse offer? and help places drive forward a clear vision for the area that plays to their strengths and the communities at the heart of those spaces. I see Jeremy coming back on, which presumably means stop talking. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> is it, is it, is it a, uh, a light hint? <laughs> uh, Rachel, I, I wasn't bringing you to the end prematurely, I hope. Um, is there any more time? <laughs> so um, um, before I, I, I pick up a couple of thoughts from what said, there's um, a couple of questions just come up which you probably may all be able to see on, on your own screen. Um, David Lum, um, um, who um, describes himself as um, an independent urbanist, um, it poses two questions, which I think can probably be roped into one. Um, and actually, in answer, uh, David, I wonder if you, if you wouldn't mind going first, because one of your very early points 
um, you suggested that CPO was a bonkers, I think you used the word idea. Um, and, um, and, and, and in respect to the point David is asking, David Lum, um, I talk about whether we can out absent landlords. Um, um, in respect to David Blum, actually, it might not be bonkers. Yeah, I know David Blum very well. Um, we, are, we, we debate these points. Um, th th there are two points here. First of all, David is absolutely right to say that um, the town centres will evolve and change. Um, and what we need to focus on is the blockages to, which stop that from happening, one of which is definitely the ownership structure of town centres and absentee landlords and the stuff that, that, that um, John was talking about, about the... The, the, they're, 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 they're not being aligned in terms of their interest with the interest of town centre. So that's absolutely right. There, there are a number of reports that have been written which says that the solution to this is to CPO all town centres and to bring them into state ownership and to control them directly, which is what I think is, is bonkers. Um, I think you would, there were ways of the, the, we need to address that issue, but that isn't the solution to the issue. I think I think um, we need to find ways of um, incentivizing owners to do that, to find alternative ways. And, and, and to be honest, a lot of them are. You know, they, the, the days of the twenty-year lease and the blue chip companies um, re required to get leases is, is long gone. Um, you know, th there is a much more flexible approach to the, these things now. But yeah, it is one of the blockages. I agree, and one that we need to deal with. Uh, thank you. And, and um, John, you, you in a previous guys um, before Sook, uh, you uh, will have had good experience in terms of your, your uh, role as landlord um, in dealing with um, uh, property as both an asset class and having to manage it as a successful business in its own right. Um, what, what's your opinion in respect of outing landlords who simply are not taking their responsibility? Uh, sorry, John. You're muted. Uh, I mean, I, I um, it, it's very challenging to out landlords. And so the approach that we've taken is to craft something that is a, as appealing to landlords and effectively trade sort of uh, put together something that looks and feels like a lease and provides more a higher income um, for that landlord at the cost of long term certainty. I mean, unfortunately, the answer to so many of these problems uh, come down to financial appeal and that's why i believe that the solution to so much of this problem is based in financial sustainability and that is our focus i know that i can't reach out to 75 percent of the landlords in the uk it's so impossible to engage with a fragmented market as a result i'm focused predominantly on institutional landlords um but i and i yeah i think starting to out absent landlords becomes incredibly problematic can I just add to that? Yeah. With conversations like this, you always risk um, creating certain sides and divisions between um, the bad landlords and uh, the good tenants or community groups who use those spaces. Um, I think in terms of flexibility, we have we have seen from a sector in terms of commercial property ownership, that it's not necessarily always super fast to adapt to brand new challenges a huge amount of change over the last six months i mean the amount of new uh leasing structures that have been um adopted by many landlords whether institutions or otherwise the amount of flexibility given to struggling tenants um, and indeed the amount of concessions that have been given and um, it's just really impressive so i think um there's obviously some that could um could do more in terms of being an active player in the success of the town centres where they invest. Um, but I think we are also seeing a lot of very good batches from landlords as well as from occupiers. Thank you. Um, actually, um, Rachel, I was going to come to you in relation to one or two points that you raised, but in fact, there's a couple of questions coming up, which I'll try. Um, there's um, Owen Lloyd, and, a, and a pro uh, apologies to Owen Lloyd, I only get um, the first part of your um, um, surname on my screen. So I, I, I know the next bit begins with a J, so forgive me <laughs> that I don't know the rest. But picking up on, on, on that point and a couple of others in, in the question, uh, James Dawson, for example, um, um, they are picking up on this A theme that um, local leadership is very important. And that's something you, Rachel, talked about towards the end of your presentation. Um, and um, um, I wonder whether um, you, you, you could support the role or the view that um, um, central government should have a role here, 
surely it should always be about um, local leaders and local authorities um, and not what central government thinks is the right solution. Yeah, no, I, I would agree with that. I think that what, what the role for central government is setting, ensuring that there is a framework and a structure in place that allows for and incentivizes and enables strong local leadership. And going back to Wayne's point um, of who should be providing that local leadership, there is no one answer to that. It needs to be strong across the board. Yes, it needs to be the role of the local authority. Yes, it needs to be the role of the bid. Yes, it needs to be the role of local communities. But it needs to be them working together um, because they will all bring different perspectives to the table. And if you see it's only one of them, then you will not have remotely a diverse or inclusive or sustainable future for that place. Can I add, can I add to that? And obviously fighting my own corner here as a business owner, but um, I mean, Rachel made the point that it's probably not government's role at the very beginning. Um, at the moment, we have some brilliant um, sort of strategic frameworks to address these issues. Think about the High Streets Task Force and the Future High Streets Fund. But as a businesses can't actually engage directly with those entities they have to do it with local authorities as a minimum and i think that is essentially a bit restrictive because as you know as i keep talking about it i believe that there is a business solution to many of these problems which should be embraced it, it, it reinterprets that question slightly and, and picking up one or two other questions that are coming through now um um, that there, there is there is a general observation, um, and I, I think Dave, if you David, if you could lead an answer to this, there seems to be a general observation that as a result of the uh, pandemic, people's preferences are to shop locally and uh, live locally. A um, couple of questions coming up about uh, whether that um, um, should give rise to the fifteen or twenty minute neighbourhood concept, which is gaining ground at the moment. Um, and, um, and Andrew Taylor's point out that that's also uh, introduced the possibility of re-examining. Um, effectively redundant parts of the high street in the sense of no longer required for retail. Um, um, David, that, that might have an impact on concepts of urbanism, which should evolve. Uh, I wonder if you want, want to have a go first. Yeah, well, yeah, very much so. We had um, we had Carlos Moreno speaking at the Academy of Urbanism Congress on, on Thursday last week, um, who's the, the um, academic in Paris who um, uh, is the advisor to Mayor Hidalgo, who came up with a 15 minute concept city. And it has got remarkable traction. We had we had um, stories from literally all over the world from Melbourne, Scotland, America and so on about people that picked up on this, this concept. And it is a real opportunity, I think, for high streets to to reimagine their role as the sort of capitals of their neighborhood providing a whole range of services and not 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 just retail um i think um the the key, the, the key thing which i think the key thing which underlies a lot of the confusion with this discussion is this idea that what do we mean what, what's in our head when we talk about the high streets um and i think there are there are one of the things that we're looking at in the research is that there are so many different types of high street from the centers of great big cities to to small industrial towns to suburban centers to um, places which are affluent and places which are less affluent and so on and a lot of these things work in terms i mean you know, at the moment a lot of local centers are actually doing very well um uh, because people are working from home and people are, 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 are local and they're using their local services but that is also something that happens it's happening in more affluent areas it's not happening in, in less affluent areas and so we, we in our head we're trying to come up with one solution and in this format rather pushes us into this um way of doing it for a whole range of different types of problems and i think um the 15 minute city works incredibly well in some areas um where there are good local facilities it's much less well suited to areas with um, poor levels of local facilities uh where you end up sort of isolating people in areas without the the things that they need so you know it's good for the middle class um local centers less so for the the, the poorer ones Thank you. Uh, John, John, in picking up that, um, D David um, posed the question, what is meant by uh, the high street? Um, and I, I suspect we could be more granular than that and, and actually refine that question as what is meant by retail. And that, that might also uh, pick up on some of the questions coming through about what the role of a centre is. If we redefine what is meant by retail, and, and that brings me back to your, your presentation, I think, John, um, then does that, does that help us find a way through to, to some of the problems being posed here? Well, I, well, I think so. And, and obviously, my view on this is a little bit radical in terms of the industry attitude towards it, which is that I believe you should look at 
um, re- real estate um, in, in terms of time slots rather than actual location slots, because um, there is very little value to a retailer being um, in a shop in a traditional way on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday from a business case perspective. But the utility of that space for all sorts of other users is enormous. And that doesn't necessarily pay in, play into sort of the traditional business approach of um, a 10 year lease, but, but it's, it has enormous intangible value for communities and place. And, and, uh, and that, that's why we've created a model that is super flexible to occupy because we believe that we can facilitate exactly that sort of interaction with underutilized spaces. I take your point um, earlier that it, it's, it's hard to do that and you're not going to turn every high street into a souk, much as I'd like it. But, um, but it, you know, but, but, it, but the, the point I think is a clear one is that we have too much space and we've got loads of people that want to use those spaces. If you can reduce the barriers to occupation, they will. And we have proven um, with our spaces that people will use it for all sorts of things that uh, you can't even imagine from baby massage to film clubs to, you know, it, it's been fantastic seeing souks used for things that we haven't even thought about. And so, so, you know, my message is to try and work out ways that we can use spaces in a more utilitarian way across 120 hours of the week. Um, closing a shop, shopping centre at six o'clock to me seems like a total waste of, of time. And I mean it in terms of time because all sorts of people want to use those spaces for all sorts of other non-retail things. Um, and, and that, thanks, John. And um, but Rachel, that, that obviously... Um, um, encourage us to look at the uh, the model um, in terms of the landlord occupier and investment model in a wholly different way. Um, in, in terms of um, the the regeneration of um, town, I, I wonder whether you've come across examples where local authorities have worked in partnership with um, uh, owners of um, property as well as the occupiers to help deliver versions of a theme um, from Souk. And, and Rachel, before you, before I let you answer, I wonder if I, I should have mentioned, and I, I didn't act on your hints much earlier, there is a, an online poll which I think is being organised by the uh, organisers of, of this uh, in relation to um, what people, uh, what um, people think uh, is the best of the three uh, solutions. Um, so just to remind um, uh, people, you've got David um, um, silver bullet, as he as he described it, in terms of uh, business rates and um, looking at the tax basis between online and physical retailing. Uh, John Suk idea, and, and and Rachel who 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 conceded that she shot, shot herself in the foot uh, right at the outset, um, and, and accepts that there's no one single solution. Um, so uh, I, I don't want to be rude, but um, I'm just trying to summarise and remind people what the uh, what they should be voting. <laughs> anyway, so Rachel, the, 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 that also leads you to redefine uh, what you <laughs> what it is you want people to vote on as well as you're yeah. going first. <laughs> I think that given uh, as much of this is going to be about what role can central government play in helping get to a uh, revived as use of the future, I would be surprised if anyone were to say uh, were to go for the government pitch on this. Maybe leave that for Secretary of State speaking later, which I'm sure people are looking forward to as well. Um, I just wanted to pick up on, um, on the point about the possibility um, of using space flexibly during the Days. So that, that's essentially, um, but not for uh, business reasons, is what our Open Doors pilot has done over the last years, which is take five different vacant properties across England um, and basically match landlords of vacant properties with community groups looking for space. Um, and it, uh, and you had... Uh, and we, you had sort of 10 different community groups using each space over the course of a week for a morning or an afternoon at the time. Um, and it wasn't for revenue raising purposes. It was purely for um, maybe language classes or film clubs or um, tutoring. Um, and, it, you know, we did it on a very small scale and compared to what Souk does. But uh, it is possible and places do benefit from it and the surrounding areas benefit from it as well because you have a wider variety of footfall. You have more community engagement to the places and, and you just need a flexible blank canvas, really, that can quickly um, be changed into something else and that isn't set up to only be provided for one type of tenant. So it is, it is definitely possible, whether for community or 
uh, business purposes. Um, the question that you actually asked me to answer was uh, to what extent are local authorities, investors and owners all able to work together? Um, I would uh, not just not to dodge the question, but I'd be as interested to see examples of it from people who are yeah. in as well, because they all have the direct experience of uh, working with these kind of places. I think you know the answer is yes, of, of course it's possible. Um, you need to have a very driven local authority that has that capacity and capability um, and that it is able to understand what it wants from its area and how to get there so that it can stand up and be if it's entering into, for example, a joint partnership with the private sector, so it can be a good client and a good partner in that. Um, I think there's, you know, local authorities are not necessarily across the board set up to do that because they're, that is not their uh, sole goal here. So as much as they can look at the examples of it happening elsewhere um, and learn from that, the better, I think. But yeah, it's, it's certainly possible whether it's on a sort of very small town scale or a major city centre in region development. I think the big challenge is, in a way, I wonder if it's almost easier if you've got a 60 acre site in the centre of a city and you've got a partner that's able to do it for 20, 20 years and has that backing. How do you make sure that that partnership happens on every mm. street in every town centre? Whether it's you're talking about, you know, five shops and a parade or whether you're talking about a 20-year regen scheme. Uh, it, well, indeed, um, a 60-acre or hectare site, that would be a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the, um, uh, just keeping an, uh, an eye on the time as well, um, one of the um, themes, Rachel, that um, you repeated a couple of times was that um, that there has been a fundamental change caused by the pandemic and we're, it's going to have a long-term impact about um, using spaces and public mingling if I'm if I can use that word in an apolitical sense um, um, and I, I wonder from from the panel's point of view um, whether whether uh, there is actually uh, the pandemic has coincided with a structural change about how generations now see um, the role of town centres and that well, it might not be a long-term response as, as a direct consequence of the pandemic, but it might be something more associated with the fact that um, the internet has changed things, uh, expectations of town centres have changed, people want a different type of experience than they've had, and actually these two events have come together pretty much at the same time. So the question really there is, uh, I'm, I'm trying to pick up some of the themes and some of the questions online. Um, it, it is the, has the pandemic simply highlighted a structural change in the way we expect our town centres to be and what we want from them? And, um, and are we trying to find solutions to new expectations? Uh, can I make two points? No, can I make two points to that? The, the, the first is that I, 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 I said, went through five crises on the high street and each one was considered to be terminal at the time. Um, and the bounce back was remarkable um, on each of them. And so in five years' time, we, we, we're in no position now to, to, to second guess what's going to happen in five years' time. It may well be that town centres bounce back to, to a much greater extent than with, we, they currently seem like they're likely to do so. That's the first point. Second point is that um, in... 2019, it was very clear that um, the retail crisis was already upon us. The landlords were already struggling. They, they, there were lots of big name retailers um, going out of business. That that, that was that was happening pre pandemic. And I think um, what was what was happening and what we the, the first six months of our research was pre pandemic. And what seemed to be happening was that the independent sector was reclaiming ground from the big multiple chains. Um, and actually vacant shop units were being taken over by independents of all sorts of kinds, retailers, leisure people, but also taken over for sort of architects office and that type of thing. And so there was a great reclaiming of the high street by the independents, which was all good news, even though it was not good news that was necessarily being reported. The problem with the pandemic is that, yes, that may be speeded up, but that independent sector will have been hit incredibly hard by the pandemic. They don't have the financial resources and backing um, to survive this. And so it may have put that process back by a number of years. But I think that's where we're going. I think we're going back to a process where big retail becomes a smaller proportion of the overall retail sector. Thank you. Um, John? 
yeah i i i would support that and and we um we predominantly work with small businesses of which even in the last week there are multiple brands sort of fighting to make their name in spite of the pandemic and using physical space in a way that that works for them i mean i I, I see everything really from an asset management and sort of landlord perspective and, and the, the big change um, that the pandemic has driven from from that perspective is is this attitudinal shift that uh, the way of doing business that all of our big pension funds and, and REITs, et cetera, rely on is evaporating. So and I think that's whilst it's difficult for the industry it is going to be good for our communities in the long term because there's a recognition that, that you know a big let's say australian reit is not going to be invested in a local community in wherever it is that they own the shopping center and that needs to be addressed and i think ultimately that 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 is a is good progress for everyone um and there will be softer and more um collaborative uh, ways of landlords and occupiers working together, which I think is fundamental to the success um, of all of our high streets. And, and finally, uh, we, we just got our five minute or four minute warning. Um, but um, I, I wonder in, in response, Rachel, whether you might just also add, um, because I, I've started to question in line to your overture piece in respect of uh, the pandemic and the long term. Uh, Joel Cohen has commented about the need for active environments uh, working with Sports England. Uh, and promotive active green spaces um just in relation to the, the structure point then is that do, do you think that that point also adds a dimension to the future of the town centre yeah definitely and i think actually that's where we saw some examples of local or combined authorities being really innovative in the first few months of lockdown saying essentially nobody's out on the streets let's take advantage of this to put cycling lanes in to increase pedestrianization to uh, make these more accessible and places that people can safely go and be outside in a more healthy and active way. So I definitely think that's an opportunity that's been created by this. Um, I would agree with what, um, what John, John and David have both said, that we need to separate out here the decline in large national retail chains from the decline in the high street overall, because they're not the same thing. Um, what people use high streets for now might not be to go and shop in a large retail chain, but it will be to go for coffee, to go to the gym, to go to a local um, office space or go get your nails done, etc. So it's how we, you know, how we continue to have those sort of independent local experience driven places. Um, but yes, I don't think, I think it's accelerating existing problems rather than creating brand new ones. And I agree that high streets are, are resilient and will be able to bounce back from this. Um, and in the last couple of minutes, um, and just to encourage people on the uh, the poll, I, I must admit, uh, I hope the organisers can hear me. I, I don't know how I access the response to the poll, so someone's going to have to do that for me, I think. But, but um, uh, just a final question then for all of you, um, whether um, we should be embracing this opportunity as a moment of um, exciting change, or we should be um, ducking and thinking this is the terrible end of the high street. Cool. In a few seconds, we go. I, I think it's a huge opportunity to revive the local high street um, through the changes that have happened during the pandemic. My big worry is the big city centres because I think they're vital to our retail sector and they are completely, well, they're not completely deserted, but th those that rely on tourism and, and, and office workers are really struggling at the moment. And that's my big concern. And, uh, uh, John? Um, uh, yeah, I agreed. Huge opportunity, not just um, to change the way we approach stuff, but also to embrace, embrace digitally native brands of which there are millions into our physical spaces, as well as potentially opening up our UK physical market to international brands through flexible approaches to physical space. Yeah, I and uh, last word to Rachel. Let's not. I, uh, I, nobody is seeing it as a positive opportunity, given what it's based on. But there definitely are opportunities uh, and to learn from what places have managed to do well over the not just over the last six months but over the last couple of years. And I think taking the chance now to build on that is definitely something that everybody is up for. Because I think if anything, this has driven home to people the importance of strong local high streets. Indeed, indeed, and we've seen some interesting. Uh 
business results on that. I think we're in our 25 seconds. So, um, Mayor, first of all, thank you very much for um, uh, A, spending time, B, your encouraging and uh, positive comments and intri- uh, interesting observations on where we go next and what happens next. Um, some great questions from people um, coming in. Um, uh, we've had a, a nearly 100 people throughout this uh, uh, um, conversation. So, um, hope it's been enjoyable for all. Um, I haven't got the results of the polls, but there you go. <laughs> So I think it says time to end, uh, and I think we have to um, press the red button. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.